Alrighty then, I think we're ready to get started, if that's okay with you all. Thanks for coming in. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. I can project pretty loud if I have to. Um, I'll apologize in advance. I got that, that thing in my throat that's going around. I can only talk about two minutes without either coughing or having to do something. But hopefully I can uh, muscle my way through. So for those that you don't know me, um, anyway, you're here to I hope you're here today to uh, talk about the future of self-publishing. And I told a couple of people earlier today, this is the best kind of presentation you can do because no matter what I say, I'm right. You know, it's, you're not going to know for 10 or 15 years if I get this all wrong. Um, so it makes it a lot, a lot of the pressure's off. I can, I can say whatever I want today. And uh, no one will remember in 10 years to come back and back fact check all of this. But if you don't know me, my name is Steve Porter. I'm the owner of Stillwater Books in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Also Stillwater River Publication, which is an independent publisher. Um, I'm an independently published author, self-published, uh, with a few books. I also do ghostwriting and editing, and I've been, spent 10 years in the corporate world of uh, book selling, and um, if I want to talk about any of that, I'll never to the booth later. Then I don't have to talk about myself so much right now. So first of all, before we start talking about the future, we kind of have to get a sense of where we were in the past. Um, Self-publishing is essentially publishing. I mean, it's as old as publishing itself. Um, you could go down the list of many infamous, famous, legendary, classic authors and find that many of them had self-published at some point in their careers. Um, everybody from Dickens to Twain to Walt Whitman all had some their hands in self publishing at some place along the line. Some of the more modern examples of books that first came out were things like The Martian, um, Selfsky Prophecy, Fifty Shades of Grey, The Shack. Those all started as self published books and all became you know, blockbusters. So it is certainly possible and it is certainly um, real that you can become a successful self published author. I don't want to get too much into the history of publishing, um, but a lot of people would talk about modern publishing today, modern books, modern novels even, starting kind of starting with Robinson Crusoe in 1719. That's when the first novel, really the kind of populace, was written. It didn't involve kings and gods and military experts. It was a, you know, a, you know, a single one guy had a bad day. And this revolutionized not only writing in the way that people write, in the way that people, that authors can present books, but it also created this whole schematic, um, this relationship between writers and publishers and printers and ultimately readers. And that structure has stayed pretty steady ever since um, you know, the 1700s. At some point, um, which is mostly a modern um, creation, the term vanity press popped up. And this was a big thing back in the, probably the 60s, 70s, even into the 80s when you picked up a copy of whether it be the New York Times Book Review or um, Writer's Digest or something, and in the back there were these little tiny ads. You know, Vantage Press, published today. And essentially what you had to do was write your book, submit it, pay a lot of money, and then fill your garage up with product. And at that point, you're on your own. So a lot of the term vanity press came to be kind of popularized for that effort. But then about 15 or 20 years ago, things started to change. Um, the concept of print-on-demand, meaning a self-published author, didn't have to fill up the garage anymore. Today, when a self-published author, or let's say a customer, orders a book written by a self-published author, they essentially order from Amazon, and it shows up on the front step in 48 hours. But what's happening is that Amazon's taking the order, notifying the printer, the printer's printing the copy, and now it goes to the customer. All essentially automatic. Wow. There is no warehouse full of books. There is no, you know, 19-year-old running up and down the aisles paying minimum wage, pulling them off the shelves. It is literally all an electronic transaction. And that absolutely revolutionized things, because now you could write a book and distribute it 
without ever having to worry about filling up your garage. Then ebooks in that era started to be a big deal. I've got a presentation on ebooks that talks about how they go back even um, 100 years when sea captains were trying to figure out how to take their libraries with them and reducing things into these tiny little slides and trying to view them with magnifying glasses. Um, but ebooks became the deal about 10 or 15 years ago. And again, another thing that revolutionized self publishing. And of course, now audiobooks. Audiobooks are hot. We're going to talk a lot about audio in a few minutes. Um, you can listen to you know, a book on your phone, in your car. You've got Bluetooth, you just put it on, you, know, you put it on, you know, hit an episode, which kind of bends into podcasts. <clears throat> and it's, it's, it's even grown into this hybrid nonfiction genre that's starting to, to, to kind of take over. With print on demand books, you get what's called democratization of distribution, which is a word um, or a phrase that was invented by uh, Mark Coker. I think he was the first to uh, utter that in terms of books, uh, to explain how even a self-published author can get their, gets, can very easily get their book on Amazon. You can very easily get your ebook listed with Kindle or Nook or Apple even, um, or Kobo or some of the others. And your book is no more or less valid than the book from Random House or Simon & Schuster or Harper or anybody else. It takes up the same amount of screen space. And then there's where we are. Um, the world is run by basically three companies, Amazon, Google, and Apple. And they are controlling content, but they're also providing opportunities. And then lastly, we talk about stigmas and quality control. 20 years ago, if you said you're a self-published author, <clears throat> usually you get a bit of a, a kind of smirk. Well, that must be because you're not very good. Because if you were good, you'd be published by a big house. And I used to say, well, if I can go for the same band you're going to go see tonight at your local club, if they were any good, they'd have a contract with capital, so why bother going to listen to them? You know, so that, there, there's a lot of ways to look at those stigmas. And then quality control. Early on, early efforts at self-publishing, a lot of mistakes, you see a lot of typographical errors, you see bad formatting. But over the last 10 to 15 years, things have started to even up. And I don't have to talk about that anymore because you've been walking around the show for the last you know, couple hours, and you can see the quality of the books that are there. You know, it's not something that just you know, fell out of printer, uh, you know, off the copy machine um, on there this morning before they jumped in the car. So now we get to talk about the fun part. Where the heck are we going with all this? <clears throat> we'll take now a look or a leap into the future. <clears throat> okay, number one, trend. Traditional publishing is dying. This is a story which I won't get into too deeply. Um, is the publishing industry broken, which recently ran a Publishers Weekly? And the story itself talks about how, you know, once upon a time, each book would come through and there'd be a team of editors that would work on it. Now they're down to maybe one. Um, design offices are packed. Marketing offices are overworked. Uh, there are mass resignations. There's an incredible number of hours that, that, that the employees are putting into this. And they're putting out pretty marginal quality at the same time with a lot of the books that are released from these big publishers in an international way. Um, is the publishing industry dying? Maybe slowly. I think as we look into the future, it's not going anywhere. But it's certainly um, changing. If you've been following the news, the book industry news anyway, you'll know that um, Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster Two of the big five publishers in the United States tried to merge. And the Department of Justice got involved and said that would be violate all kinds of antitrust and um, other, other laws. And some of and the, 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 the case recently um, was um, the Department of Justice basically won the case and they prevented the merger of the two houses. <coughs> Excuse me. But what really was interesting to me 
was in the documents that were filed, some of the little facts that kind of oozed out the bottom that publishers don't like to talk about. So if you're a traditionally published author, you might want to put your fingers in your ears for a minute. Um, but just some of the statistics are crazy. 90%, 98% of all books published in 2020 sold fewer than 5,000 copies. So if your goal is to be traditionally published, you finally get that contract, 98% chance you're only going to sell 5,000 copies or less. A lot of the authors sitting out here who are self-published are doing twice that. Second one, they have publishers wait and see how sales are going before they invest in marketing. You know, think about that for a minute, too. You make your big contract, you finally get signed by that big publishing house, you are ready, you're excited, and then you're going to find out they're not even going to promote your book because they want to see how it does first. They're not going to waste their money promoting you until they're sure they've got a hit on their hands. Of the 58,000 trade books available in 2020, only one half sold fewer than 12 copies each. Publishers spend less than 2% of their budgets on marketing. Penguin Random House alone had a 44% market share of authors who sell 500,000 copies or more per year. So if that's your goal, to be that big time million, million book you know, author, you don't have a lot of choices. And then the last statistic here it was 91% of all bestsellers in 2021 came from the big five publishing houses, which is uh, which is um, Penguin Random House, Simon & Schuster, Macmillan, Hachette, and Harper. So essentially, if you want to be on the New York Times bestsellers list, if that is your dream, you have to be published by one of those five houses. So five houses are basically telling you what 91% of all the bestsellers in the United States are every year. Five, essentially five entities. So when we talk about, you know, is the traditional publishing industry dying? It's pretty healthy in many ways, but it is taking a slow death. Hmm? Uh, for trade books, is that just books through one of the big publishing houses? Yes. All right, so now we have a, we have a demographics test. <coughs> okay, so who, who has no idea who this person is? This is Jeanette McCurdy. She has the hottest book in the United States. It spent nine weeks at number one on the New York Times bestsellers nonfiction list. It's currently, I'm still on the Times list right now. It's actually a very good, very interesting story. I listened to a podcast from her when she was, uh, she was doing some interviews for NPR. <clears throat> it's, um, if you don't know who she is, she was an act, a teen actress um, about 10 or 15 years ago on a Nickelodeon program called iCarly. And the story is basically about her mother and how her mother, um, and her relationship with her mother, and how she caused all kinds of problems with eating disorders and, and self esteem and other issues. Um, told a lot of humor, but also you know, a lot of seriousness. This book came out in the spring, or maybe the last second of March or April, and took the publishing industry by storm. It went from just a small little print run put out by, I think it was uh, the assignment, Simon and Schuster. And um, this was the hottest book in the country for about three months. No one could get their hands on it. It would print, reprint, and reprint over and over again. And she has a tremendous story to tell. She really does. Um, I, I'm not trying to put her down. My point here is the demographics of the book industry are changing. Because if you didn't know who she was, you wouldn't go out and buy the book. But people were buying the book because they did know who she was. And the reason they knew who she was is because they grew up with her. They, they, when they were in middle school, you know, elementary school, middle school, maybe even high school, they were watching her on this kid's show. But now that's 10, 15 years later, instead of being 15, now they're 30. And they've entered the book buying business. And now that they're starting to buy books, they're buying books that interest them, by people that are interested in to them. They're not buying books by the rock stars and the TV stars of the 50s and 60s and 70s like people my age do. They're buying as their own little demographic. And this is one of the things that fueled it. Um, now to tie into the last trend I talked about a minute ago, how the publishing industry really doesn't know how it's, what it's marketing until it's marketing it. 
She wrote this book. It also ties into the stage performance that she does on the topic. Um, and again, so I would actually describe it as a very interesting book. I, I think it's worth reading. But because this was such a huge blockbuster, she got a deal, a seven-figure deal to write a novel. She's never written a novel before. So I'm not picking on her, but asking the question, why would the industry do this? But I can like the quote there on the side, it actually says, you know, um, the, new, the New Deal, the agent added, marks a step where Curdy has long wanted to take to that wants to write fiction. But Ryan mm -hmm. said, being a novelist is her dream job. Well, it's all our dream job, that's why we're all here, isn't it? So she got the seven figure deal, not because she's a great writer, not because she an, has an amazing talent to put words on the page, but because of who she is and because she has now proven herself as a best-selling author. So whatever novel comes out, good or bad, is going to rise like a rocket up the bestsellers list, and that will probably determine how many other books she ever puts out. <clears throat> but if it's a bestseller, you know they're going to want to repeat it. So I talk about the broken publishing industry. I talk about how they don't really know how to market their books. They're not doing as good a job as the folks that are out here in the world. They really don't have that. They don't have as much savvy as you think they do. Or maybe they have more, who knows? Because I'll bet whatever book does come out will go to number one. Next trend, trying to find niche titles. <clears throat> readers know what readers want. Readers like to read in genre. And you see that when you go to bookstores, because almost every bookstore is organized the same way. There's a romance section over here, mystery section over there, fantasy section, science fiction section. And as readers, readers are trained to do that. But when you come to marginalized titles, or, or titles that are marginalized, top of marginalized topics, or writers um, who don't have the same depth or opportunities, or maybe writing in, in subgenres, or new genres, or trying to invent their own thing, or being creative. These titles are getting harder and harder to find. Because what the publishing company industry needs, they need more than just never This is a story from about two, maybe three months ago. <clears throat> Barnes & Noble announced it was no longer ordering hardcover, middle age, middle grade reading books. Because they were just not selling that well at least in Barnes & Noble's opinion. Being the dominant bookstore chain, this really upset publishers. But the publishers didn't care that much, they'll just stop printing things. But what really upset were the authors. Because the authors now, particularly in those communities where they're not getting that big, wide presentation that, that, that the big authors are getting, they're seeing their books now, likely their contracts drying up, and likely the fact that they won't be able to distribute anymore. And that Barnes & Noble won't carry their books. So this was a, a revolutionary moment. Um, fewer titles at Barnes & Noble means more book buyers will be looking online for niche titles. So if you like to read in a specific niche, a specific topic, you're going to go online. And who's online? Not the big publishers, but the self-published authors. So as BNN selection becomes less diverse, marginalized writers will turn to self-publishing options. <coughs> Excuse me. So the next big trend, something that's, that's changing now rapidly, is audio. Only, if I think the, the percentage, I'm trying to remember, I should have written this down, I think it's 17%, maybe even less, of the books in print right now are available on audio. And audio sales are exploding. ACX, which is a random another Amazon company, is the dominant mechanism by which you can upload audiobooks. So if you want to write a book and then make it available on audio, you can simply hire talent to read it. And you get professional voice actors who will read the book for you. And it's uploaded as a digital file, and then Readers or listeners can then download it at their leisure. Works out great. The problem is hiring voice talent is very expensive. And if you're going to, if you think about how long it takes to read a book, 
and reading it out loud so that you are speaking clearly and slowly so that every word is easily identifiable. Uh, it's a lot of work, it takes a lot of time, and to do an audiobook correctly is going to could cost you between five and seven, eight thousand dollars if you had to pay for that. Sometimes more, depending on on what you're doing. A lot of I know romance authors very much like to have not just one but two or three or four voices that are that are interspersed. Um, if the book has a particular, if the author, or, excuse me, the character has a particular accent, you know, if it's Australian or British, French or something, you want to have that as part of it. So it can get, it can get quite complex. So audio books right now are hot. Every independent author should be looking towards the next 10 years as the opportunity to put your books out on audio that with the same opportunity you had 15 years ago to put your books out as an ebook. Because they are exploding that fast. Sales are up double digits in every company that does this. The exciting part of audio right now is AI, is the artificial intelligence that's coming with it. Google right now, and I had the opportunity, I was at a conference in Las Vegas a few weeks ago, <clears throat> I had the opportunity to test drive a Google AI audio creation product where it would you literally just take your manuscript, whatever you've written, upload it to this particular app in Google, and it would then read it back to you in an artificial voice. Now, when you first you think about this, you think about you know the, the, the mechanical robot voices, you know, from the 80s and 90s movies. It's not like that at all. In fact, they gave you a choice of, I think it was there were up to 50 different voices you could choose in different accents and different tones, different ages. So if you want a 19-year-old to read your beer narrator or a 70-year-old, all these things have been taken into account. And it takes less than 10 minutes to upload your file and have a completed audiobook ready to listen to. And listening to it, you can still hear the difference. You can still tell it's not quite human, but for the most part, it's pretty darn good. Then the next level, as they continue to improve that technology, and that technology is available right now, and it's free. It's not going to cost you a grant to upload a book. It's going to cost you nothing. The next level is they have another tool where you essentially then get to read your own book. But instead of reading the book, you're going to be given a series of paragraphs. And you read these paragraphs. It's kind of thing, like in the old typing days, if you ever took typing classes, for those who you want a typewriter is. You had to type, you know, quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog's back a hundred times. Well, you basically read a paragraph that says that, and it grabs every syllable and inflection and vowel and consonant then you upload your manuscript and it applies your voice to the entire book. That takes about 10 to 12 minutes to do. And now you're reading an entire book that you've never read before. And the tech, now again, the technology, when you listen to it, it's not quite perfect, it's not great, but man, it is good. And this is now, over the next few years, is going to revolutionize the way audiobooks are done. ACX, which is the dominant um, audio retailer through Audible, has a restriction against artificial intelligence audio. They will not allow it. It has to be read by a human voice. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. I mean, partially they're protecting the business, and they're also protecting all the artists, all the voice artists, who have made careers out of reading these books. But the AI is so good that... It's only a matter of time between before everybody is accepting them. Right now, you can upload to Google, you can upload to Kobo, you can upload to YouTube, you can upload to your own website, you can put these audio books everywhere. So it's only a matter of time before ACX turns around and looks, and, and Audible looks, turns around and looks at, hey, we're losing money by not carrying those. And they will then start to accept those files. Once that happens, Again, that democratization of distribution. You no longer have to put down eight, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars to hire professional voice talent. Your book can be up there right away. 
And this is kind of like the future. This and this is really the, 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 the bottom line: is the technology which has fueled self-publishing for the last 15 years is still evolving and will fuel self-publishing over the next 15 years. Mention audio technologies. Ebook readers are becoming more and more interactive to the point where, you, where readers and writers can interact and write together and, and communicate while they're writing and reading a book. There was a major merger in the ebook world um, earlier this year with Smashwords, which is Mark Coker's company that um, was one of the early uh, pioneers, for lack of a better word, of the ebook revolution. And then draft to digital, which is one of the more popular formats of uh, companies that will format your book into ebook. They merged this year with plans of becoming also a print on demand provider. Right now, if you want print on demand paperbacks, your choices are pretty much KDP, which is an Amazon product, or Ingram Spark. And now there are more print on demand companies entering that part of the business. So as things start to grow, as the technology starts to expand, printing is getting cheaper, although paper is going up. Paper costs, that's a whole other discussion why paper is exploding in pricing. But while paper is exploding, the technology to print on that paper is dropping. And it's keeping prices down. So you're still able to print a lot of books fairly inexpensively. And more of these print on demand companies are now starting to get into the business. And at the end, I want to leave about 10 or 15 minutes for questions, because then we can go off on 100 different candidates. Um, number one, finally, paper books. We've heard for years that paper books are going out of, the, out of style. Everybody's going to go to e-books. Everybody's going to audio books. Don't believe it for a second. The paper book is the greatest invention in mankind's history right after the wheel. It's not going anywhere. Even as these demographics change, people who were coming up who were teenagers 15 years ago, who are now you know, part of the, the adult buying world, still buying book paper books. Second trend we're seeing is that more traditionally published authors are now choosing self-publishing options. If you go out and talk to the traditionally published authors that are here, um, we have Padma Venkatram and John Land, Mark Arsenault. They're constantly looking at other options for their books. They write different things. They like writing different things. And they like the freedom that self-publishing brings. They can write what they want to write without having to deal with the editors <coughs> at their, their houses. Self-publishing is also fast. You can put a book out. If you've got a completed manuscript, you can put a book out in 60 to 90 days. Whereas in the traditional publishing world, it takes a year or two. Um, third bullet, Amazon will continue to dominate. And for self-published authors, that is good news. Well, there are a lot of Amazon bashers out there. Um, it's hard to say, hi, I'm a fan of Amazon these days. It's some of the crazy stuff that they do. However, for the self-published author, there is no better friend. They're giving you full distribution. They're, you're able to print through them if you want to. They can get you books rapidly and the prices are all reasonable. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's no reason. I look at myself as, a, as an independent bookstore, an independent author, and I try to make my living in this crazy business. And I say, okay, my choices are one or two. I can, a, I can go up against Amazon and try to beat them. Or B, I can try to partner with them and write their coattails. If they want to make a trillion dollars, I'm happy to make a couple of billion. <laughs> Haven't got there yet, but we're, we're, that's the plan. That is the plan. With forthcoming new technology, particularly artificial intelligence, it's going to be fast and easy to convert your print book to an audio book. And more players are coming into print on demand, ebooks, and the audio book markets. One thing I didn't talk a lot about in here are foreign rights. It kind of gets starts to get people start to get glossy eyed when you start talking about foreign rights and other things. But it's a small world. If your book is on audio, if you can just with the snap of a finger convert it to an ebook uh, or to an audio book, 
The other snap of the finger, you can translate that to French, Spanish, German, whatever. So you can be the first, one of the first authors in your genre to be distributing internationally in all languages, essentially for nothing, without any big financial investment. And then the last book is the changing demographics, the last point here. And this is, this is the, uh, probably the most important point. We talked about, you know, Jeanette McCurdy in her book, and we can pick on that if you want to. But, but readers who grew up, when they're 10, 12, 15 years old, buying independently published books, that stigma to them doesn't exist. They're reading books that were self-published and liking them and buying more. And they don't see the stigma that a lot of the older authors and older folks have seen or that we had to put up with 15, 20 years ago when we first started publishing ourselves. It really has, what that, and what that changing demographic structure means is that there are going to be new opportunities, that the readership is expanding. And so over the next five to 10 years, these are the things that are going to dominate self-publishing. And this is where I think that as a self-published author, if it's something that you're hoping to be involved in, if you don't have a book already, I mean, these are the things you want to stay focused on. Uh, the week before Thanksgiving, I was in Las Vegas at a conference. The conference had 2,000 um, <coughs> independent authors present at Pi's part of the conference, with another 1,000 uh, participating virtually. I, I don't remember how many presentations there were, but there were over 300 that we sat through um, over the course of uh, five days on all different industries, from, from writing craft to marketing. But what was interesting is that all the people that put this huge, giant conference on were all independent authors who are making six figures or more as a career with their writing. Because they've adopted a lot of these, these trends and they're also trying to take advantage of them now. When you go to them and say, you know, hey, would you be interested in putting your series out as a traditionally published series, maybe through Random House? They'll just kind of wrinkle their nose at you and say, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to make 20 cents, 15 cents a book royalty when I can make $6 or $7 a book royalty? Why do I want to put myself through all that marketing? Essentially, when you're marketing a book from, for a big five publisher, you're marketing for them, not for yourself. Why would I want to go through all that trouble? Uh, Ruth Cardello, who used to live in Cumberland, she wrote a romance series. Um, several years ago, her cat was offered a $1 million contract from Penguin for her romance novel series that she declined. She said, why would I take a million dollars if I'm making $250,000 a month? So do we all make that kind of money as an independent author? No. The point is that the opportunities are there. And they are real. And that as we go into the next 5, 10, 15 years in this business, I think that these are the trends that we want to keep our eye on. And those authors who are successful with their work, those who are take the business approach, learn these topics, I think those are the ones who are going to be um, on top of this when the dust settles. So those are my final thoughts and my predictions on where this is all going to go. There are no unicorns or fairies or elves or anything running the business at this point. But I'd be happy to take questions or even hear what your thoughts are on where you think this is all heading. Yes, sir. Uh, I was just wondering, you know, with the, you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear you this, the stigma is kind of going away on the self-publishing, but what about promoting and marketing? Is it, isn't that where you get the money to just get the book out in front of people and give them word of mouth about it? And, you know, it's something to be able to publish it. You know, the, the well, sure. I mean, marketing and marketing is the... We had a friend who got her, got her contract from Harper and went in and sat for her first meeting with the editors. And she's already a signed contract and everything. And the first question they had for her was, so how are you going to be promoting your book? And it's like, I said, and she, her feeling was, well, isn't that what you guys do? They don't. Um, marketing is about content. Writers write. And once you have content and you have writing, not just one book, but multiple books, multiple short stories, multiple characters, and you know how to manipulate the, that content, 
That's where the marketing power is. For example, if you've got a, you know, if you have three books of fantasy series, of fantasy novels, and you want to promote that, you might write a one, a short story, one-off short story for one of the characters in the series that isn't important, and then provide that as free content to anyone who signs up to buy one of your other three books. And then when there's a deal on, you know, when you convert them all to audio, you know how to manipulate your content. So you can give maybe the first book away free in exchange for the purchase of the next two. Then the next part is collecting data. No one, there are some people out here who are very good at it. No one ever should get away from you who bought your book and you don't know who they are. Email, you know, email list is still God, having a strong email list. But it, it is about the marketing, but it's not straight. Dump some money into, a, into an ad and sit back and hope for the best. It's very, it's very, very, very interactive. So earlier, you were very popular that um, the book would not be going anywhere because each generation always have a natural preference for handheld books, which I do agree that handheld is obviously more tangible and more better, but wouldn't it be kind of like irresponsible to say that or maybe in the next, not even like the next uh, 10 years, in the next five years, that uh, the government crack down uh, or some states to be like, okay, you know what, in order to preserve paper, since scans are more expensive, and the education of uh, sometimes you can easy print, you know, books from Amazon, they will basically crack down and say, now um, paper is going to be extremely high, that no ordinary person can, like, let's say, for a uh, general $6 paperback, right? And then now a lot of books will be digital. I mean, it's going to be profit, but it won't be like as profitable because, um, in my fear, sometimes I feel like when the market increases, it may isolate viewers for buying like more, I guess, tangible goods. Well, there's a there's a crisis with paper right now, that which is true. Um, there between the fact that. And, and not to get political at all, but there are a lot of laws that prevent you know different places to be har trees to be harvested, and that you know you have to have a cer certain goals of how much gets replanted when you harvest trees, and there's an international treaty that prevents the United States from importing paper from countries that don't follow a lot of those different things. So that's some of the things that have driven up uh, the cost of paper and all. But there are more books being printed and purchased right now than there have ever been in our history. The trend is going up like a ride. <clears throat> so I don't see anybody stepping in to try to, to stop printing of any kind. I think that would be. Yeah. I don't know very much about audiobooks, so I'm fascinated by that particular segment of your presentation. Um, and I personally have never been a, a fan of audiobooks. I, I dislike audiobooks on a personal basis because I feel like it's forced reading where I can read it at my own pace, but I can't listen to audio at my own pace. So, I'm fascinated by two things. One is, what is the demand side in audiobooks? Why do you think people like audiobooks? And does the demand differ significantly based upon the type of content? You know, is, is fiction more popular for audiobooks? Is nonfiction more popular? And, I mean, a lot of books come out as audiobooks, and I, I don't quite get that. Like, I just recently. Uh, got John Meacham's book, you know, came out last week, and he reads the audiobook <coughs> for that itself, which I found unusual. Um, so that's my first question. W will the audiobook demand segment into different marketing segments? And then the second question is, you talk about the technology audiobooks being revolutionary, but I understand that, you know, uploading a, a text file and downloading some, an audiobook from Google or whatever is new, but there have been for at least 10 years um, fairly decent um, add-ons to text readers. So for example, on Amazon there's you know the free FB reader, paper book reader, and it has a module that's also free that interacts with the supply default Amazon text to speech, which is a, a Google product and, and it's also fairly good. So in real time, it takes an, e an EPUB file or something like that that's in your ebook reader and it just reads the text to you. Mm -hmm. 
difference. And how does that, and that's never been terribly popular, and you refer to that as like a robotic voice, but I don't think it's, it's bad in that sense. I mean, it's a very useful thing. How does that differ from the technology that you see emerging? I think that it's it's the, the technology that's emerging now is is is, is diverse is a diverse number of voices. You know, right now they think have seventy or eighty voices, um, and then that will that's just everyday grows. So you're not just getting the whatever the download is, and, and it's, it may be in five ten years that this technology is so prevalent that the whole audiobook industry collapses on itself because you can get everything for free. Which is, you know, all you can do is then try to compare that to what happened in the music industry, um, and then what ha what's happening with ebooks. And with ebooks, when ebooks came out, that was the prediction as well. When, when ebooks were prevalent, and everybody has full access to ebooks, who's ever going to buy a paperback again? And the opposite happened. Paperbacks actually increased in sales. Um, so I think that one of the problems in publishing overall is exposure. It doesn't get enough exposure. It doesn't get to enough people. And the more people it gets to, the more books and items and products sell. So for right now, at least in the next, the short term, I think there's a good idea, a good, um, a good opportunity to jump on this audio trend and do and, and you know be successful. You know, five years from now, you're right. The technology could can't itself out. But for the short term, there's no risk either. Um, now the second the second question, which is really the first question, uh, talking about you know the genres, and epic, fiction or nonfiction, one of the trends we've seen with nonfiction is people like to listen to audiobooks in their cars, they get the apps are on their phone, they you know, knock it out with Bluetooth, you hear it on your speakers in the car, you can save it, pause it, you can do all kinds of stuff so you don't lose your place. Um, with nonfiction, particularly, a lot of nonfiction books now are coming out. They're not actually read traditionally, like the way you read. I guess you have Nietzsche reading his uh, his memoir or whatever that is. Um, instead, they're doing it as, as kind of they're kind of uh, emulating podcasts. So you take a book like uh, like that, or we're talking to Mark Arsenal out in the ballroom about this a little while ago, taking a let's say a thirty chapter nonfiction book. And instead of reading it, breaking it into 30 pieces. And each one becomes podcast episode one, podcast episode two, podcast episode three. And again, and that ties into what you were talking about marketing, where now we've got an audience. So if I've got an audience listening to one and two and three, and I know who that audience is, I can also sell them my paperbacks, my other books, my ebooks, give them a free offer. They call it reader magnet, some kind of short story or something to draw that in sell them my other products and as that that progresses. So it all becomes like a, a giant everything's connected. Everything becomes interconnected. So you're suggesting effectively a convergence <coughs> in the form of audiobook between podcast and print. I think that's I think that will emerge. I do. <laughs> um, I just I'm using an example here of a friend of mine who recently he finished his novel. He put it up on uh, Amazon. <laughs> And it's uh, print on demand. You can do either a paperback or a hardcover. I think it's like sixteen ninety nine for a paperback. Does that sound about right? And uh, twenty three ninety nine for a hardcover. But it also says an uh, an e copy. But those Amazon has those for free. So what's to, if Amazon is doing that for free? Right. Well, they're free. They're free, but they're to prefer for subscription. So you pay for the subscription, whether it's Prime or. or okay, so so you Prime subscription. <coughs> so, Excuse me. How would how would you make any any money on that? Let's say you know you know five people buy a paperback, three people buy a buy a hardcover, but say fifty people do the do the e-reader. He will be getting a royalty for each of those downloads. For each of those ebook downloads, even though it's Amazon is saying they're selling it for zero, um, they're actually selling it at a subscription rate, and the author does get paid for that. Right. He does but, get a royalty. But and the, if, if I'm paying Amazon nine ninety nine a month, right? You know, for mm -hmm. for that, I, I still don't understand how Amazon is making any money on it, and anybody else is getting paid because you know if I go and I download fifty books this month. 
you know, and I got the Amazon Prime and the, mm-hmm. the, and the app and I'm watching. I don't, I don't understand. Anyway, the Amazon doesn't that. make any money out of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Amazon's not making any money out of it? Uh, potentially, no. That's been their, that's been their, their marketing, uh, that's been their, their business model since day one. They lost millions and millions and millions for years building their, their base before they even got to that point. Um, but uh, they're probably losing money at it. They lose money on their books frequently because they'll put them out for they'll put them out for sale. And Amazon is all about conversion rates. It's not about traffic. It's not about sales. It's about conversion rates. How many people visit that listing and how many people purchase that listing? That's that's all Amazon cares about. And if they have a customer who's converting fast, they want to grab you. They don't care if you lose they're losing money on that sale because they got you for the next hundred sales. And that's that's how they they've structured their structured that. But yeah, they don't have to make money on those. That that's they think they, they have more loss leaders than they have. Because uh, again, that runs into like the promotions and stuff like that. You know, I mean, talk with my friend. Most of those sales were word of mouth, friends and family and stuff like that. You know, I mean, he doesn't. I mean, how, how do you promote? You get a website out there. You know, you can. Get your website, look your website out, or how do you? Well, how do I print them? Well, even yeah, that's that's a tough question to answer because you know, how do I promote my book? Is this a, I, you know, there's a ninety minute answer to that. You yeah. know, that's that's huge. But I think he's the way you're describing it. He's thinking of it incorrectly. Yeah. Rather than thinking of it as I have a book, how do I promote it? I have content. How do I maximize that content among a readership and collect collect those readers? That should be the focus of marketing, not. Gee, how do I sell my thing? Because as long as that's the goal, then every single sale is effort. Rather than collecting who the readers are and then using them, getting them a short story, getting them a, <clears throat> getting them booked on a, a chapter, getting them booked on a piece, collecting those names, knowing who your readers are. So when book two comes out, I've already got a hundred names. I know I'm going to hit. When book three comes out, I've got a thousand names. When book four comes out, I've got ten thousand names. That's how you make money at this. One book, one off, one sale, one shot at the time. You're not going to have much success. It's interesting to listen to you because I was in the digital marketing industry for a while. So, I mean, it's brilliant, right? You, you, you're right on, on target. Oh, thank you. All <laughs> not you to say that, but, you know, it's, it is, but it's interesting because you lose the, I suppose, the, um, the romance of being a writer. Because you're no longer a writer, you are a worker, and you are a marketer, and you are a content producer. So you almost have to think of any, you know, drop any illusion that you had of being the next whomever, whoever your, your favorite is, the next Hemingway, the next Tolkien, the next, you know, uh, Herbert, uh, it doesn't matter. You are a content producer, you're a marketer, you've got the website. You've got your content, you've got a content calendar that you have to put out, you have to do cross promotions, you have to put it on Instagram, on TikTok, on all of these things. You have to build a followership, you have to maintain a list, you have to, right? Like it's suddenly you, to be a writer and to be successful at it, you have to learn an entirely different set of skills that have to do with digital marketing and promotion. That's an interesting yeah, it, change in the industry. It is. Right? And, and you don't get to just sit at a typewriter and produce it and then you know, live in Havana half the year. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't get too much into that at the beginning, you know, talk about that at the beginning because it's, you know, a lot of it comes down to expectations when you write a book. You know, you put a book, you write your first book. I put my first book out, you know, 12 years ago and I was thrilled that one person bought it. And it's like, that made me happy. And I'm, you know, that, that's it. I'm done. Yeah. That's all I needed. Um, but I wanted more than one. And, but if that's what your goal is, if that's your goal in writing your book, it's just for family, friends, you know, maybe your writing group and all, you, can guide, you, want, you want to be able to achieve that in your life, it's very easy to do. It's, 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 and it's very satisfying, it's a lot of fun. But if you want to make a career out of being a writer, that's, that takes work, it takes time, it takes research. I, I feel bad every time I talk to an author out there who when they want. When they want to, you know, they want their book in Barnes and Noble, and they don't have a, a clue how Barnes and Noble works. It's like, well, why do you expect them to take your book? It's like, well, because it's a book. And I also read a lot of writers; they just love to write, and I love to write, and they just want to stay in their basement and write all day. Well, somebody else worry about all the rest of that stuff. Well, it doesn't work that way. 
You know, no more than you can run a restaurant and just want to cook all day. Well, you don't let people know you're cooking, nobody's going to come to your restaurant. <clears throat> But, um, so, with that kind of um, analogy we see right now, um, that means for those kind of writers, traditional publishing will work out better for them? Um, well, traditional publishing and self publishing really become two different worlds. We, we tend to think of them as the same thing because you're a writer, you like to write stuff. So, you know, you, maybe you want to traditionally publish, maybe you want to self publish, but they really are two different paths. And they're two different ways of writing, and they're two different ways of um, marketing books. Um, you know, talk, please talk to the folks out there about traditional writing and publishing. Um, because, you know, John Land, particularly, who sits out there uh, they're in the middle of the ballroom, John knows more about this than, you know, I'll know in my lifetime. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's more complicated than, oh, that's right, all you can do is a job is just to write. Well, you didn't warn that basically with that pathway, they barely even market your own work, which means that they found you to market your own work. If you're traditionally published, if Random House reads your work and says, my God, this is the best thing I've read in years, we're going to publish it, you're still going to have to market your own work. They're going to drive you crazy with what you're going to need to do to promote, promote, promote. Okay. You okay? Yeah. I'm also curious. That's okay. The timing is perfect because we have to wrap it up anyway. And this is the last presentation in the room, so if you're going to. <laughs> no worry at all. One last question? Yeah. Uh, so it seems like traditional publishing kind of brings a lot of the aspects together for you. So if I'm self-publishing my first book, in my brain, like, okay, I need an editor, an illustrator, and I throw a PDF at Amazon and I get it. What other people am I going to be looking for to be involved in that process other than um, Depending on how much you want to do yourself. Yeah, exactly. um, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you have you know, illustration experience, it's still it's a good idea to get a professional cover illustrator. It's a good idea to get someone who knows how to set up the interior of a book correctly. There is an order for stuff at the beginning, the front matter and the back matter. Don't mix them. Um, librarians will hate you forever. You know, so, that, that, so you want to get somebody, it's nice to maybe, maybe contract someone to do that. That's uh, formatting. Yeah, you know, nuts and bolts stuff for you so, you so you know it's right. Yeah. Same with copy editing. Um, you want someone, somebody who's worked on books. You know, if your best friend got an A in English in high school, then not <laughs> your copy editor. And I hear that a lot. Oh, but my wife's a teacher, she read it. Okay, that's not a copy editor. Book editors have a particular experience with working with books. They're looking for things other than just spelling grammar and punctuation and consistency issues, how you use everything from the Oxford comma to uh, continuity. Continuity is a good one. Uh, even just simple things like OK versus OK, Y, and abbreviations, and capitalization. And we work, we do military fiction, and we help publish our company. And I've never been in the military myself, but folks that have tell me that you know, like when they get a memo, everything's capitalized. So now we get their manuscript and everything's capitalized. And then they argue with us. No, 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 that looks wrong. So it's, it's you know, it, it's finding those pieces that you do well and doing them. And then finding those pieces that you can't handle. Finding the people and getting the yeah. right guy to do yeah. <laughs> But anyway, I want to end it there because I'm at, I'm at an hour. I was only supposed to go 45. But the questions were great. I didn't want to stop. But I am more than happy to discuss any of these issues out at our table, the ballroom. Uh, right there in the middle, we got the, the corral and the center. So thank you for coming today to the expo. And thank you for participating in the session. It seems like...